I'm going to uh, quickly give an intro to this topic, and then uh, I'll invite you guys to join into the panel. You can already, if you if you want to, talk about uh, is whether the Bitcoin is killing the planet. If that's a subject that touches your heart, I invite you to the stage already uh, and uh, have a debate with me on that. Let's uh, let's kick off with the usual disclaimer for the, also the people who are watching the stream and the video afterwards, because probably I'll be cutting this to pieces. I am not your financial advisor. This is not advice. Do your own research. Don't trust any single word I say. Um, invest in your own risk if you're going to invest. We don't endorse any projects. And we're simply telling you our experience and our opinions here. And hopefully we can provide some value. But uh, please, can't stress it enough. Do your own research. I know it's boring, but it's worth it. So, I, I talked about the ICOs and the problems and the purpose of each project earlier. And now let me uh, talk a little bit more in detail about the specific use case of Bitcoin. And to my, uh, to, uh, my opinion is that the most important uh, quality or so-called killer app of Bitcoin is sound money. Uh, what sound money means, well, you can compare it to gold, which I have here, digital gold. So it should be something that is scarce, that it can't be um, printed out without a limit, like the central bank money is. So that means that Bitcoin as well has, uh, has inflation, but um, the inflation is, uh, takes work. So actually you have to put in effort and work to generate new coins. So that's called proof of work. So that's, that's what gives Bitcoin network its uh, security and uptime. So very important, and it takes a lot of resources to mine these bitcoins. And another very important part is censorship resistance. And what that means is that first time in human history we have a tool that allows us to store uh, the value of our work for future, uh, for future use. And uh, the fact that it, it's def uh, deflatory means that it goes up in value when the demand goes up is just a side bonus. So uh, for most uh, intents and purposes, it will be uh, a good enough application if you could do some work, save that money, and not have somebody seize it or uh, tax you for it via inflation, which is a hidden tax, of course. And uh, inflation in, in this context means that the uh, money supply will be inflated due, due to printing new money. And the, uh, how it differs from Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is scarce, so that means that it has a limited maximum supply, after which it won't be mined anymore, and that amount is 21 million. So that's something to consider when you, when you look at the uh, usage amount at the moment. Uh, there's some estimates that about 1% of internet users use Bitcoin, which is uh, quite, a, quite a low percentage. And also if you look at the market cap of all the cryptocurrencies, it's around 400 billion, I believe at the moment, and if you compare that to any other asset class, it's, it com comes quite clear that we are in the very beginning. But again, uh, do your own research. This is just some ideas I'm throwing out there. Um, durability, also a very important part of uh, uh, sound money. So if you compare it to, for example, gold, gold is uh, very durable, sure it dents, but uh, you can melt it and, and build new, new things out of it. It's malleable. Um, Bitcoin is also a similar way, um, I wouldn't say it's indestructible, but it's pretty, uh, pretty close to that. There's a website called uh, bitcoinoptime.com that tracks the re uh, real-time um, uptime of the Bitcoin network, which at the moment I think is 99.99% or something like that. So very um, robust protocol. And oh, yeah, of course, there's uh, saleability, which means that you can reliably trust that you can sell this uh, asset or this uh, piece of uh, monetary equipment, which is Bitcoin in this in instance. You can sell it for a certain amount of value or maybe more than that. So uh, highly, highly saleable and highly liquid, I would say. So a little bit about trust, we were talking about the trustless systems, which is uh, a lot of times it's a little bit in inaccurate to say that Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies are trustless, like, like somebody from the audience pointed out. You, you still have to uh, um, 
maybe not trust, but you can verify the code. So what we try to do is trust as little as possible. So if you can trust that the code works because it's maintained by such a, a large pool of people and developers. And they are in there voluntarily. So nobody is paying. There's no uh, Bitcoin company that pays them to be there. They are there from their own free will and incentives. And uh, the incentive model is exactly what makes, makes Bitcoin so strong because it incentivizes correct behavior rather than attacking the network. Um, yeah, and uh, cryptography comes, in, comes into play so that uh, all, all of these uh, transactions are cryptographically um, uh, proven or backed or encrypted and they can be verified. It can be verified uh, if, if you are the lawful owner of a Bitcoin address or not. And this is the reason why Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, identity cannot be uh, found out because nobody has, has signed the uh, message using the Genesis block key, which is the first block ever mined, which would uh, conclusively prove if you are actually Satoshi, very easy to do. So um, uh, the future of banks, I would say, uh, because this is well, the, the banks have so far been the trusted party that uh, takes care that the ledger is updated and every transaction actually happens. Uh, the future of banks uh, is, of course, in jeopardy because everybody will have a Swiss bank account in their pockets. So we have to think about the incentives of banks, of how, how would they need to adjust their business models to stay in business later. Maybe custodian services and uh, loan services, certainly, still. Uh, here's a little bit about the security. I think we're not going to go that much into the technicalities, but uh, <clears throat> we can go in, into uh, those different algorithms in the panel. What I will say here is that uh, what comes uh, uh, the proof of work security, I actually uh, just today or yesterday saw this video about uh, this reference to Animal Kingdom proof of work. Which, uh, which means that if you are tr trying to tr uh, if you want to trust an animal to be truthful, uh, that you come at an expense. And what what is the kind of like a wasteful uh, performance or show of, of power or energy cons uh, consumption of, of energy to, for example, a bird? So you can when when bird is going to try to find a mate. Um, then uh, they will use these flashy feathers and, and uh, do all these dances and put up a lot of energy. So that, that speaks to their true intentions. They are willing to waste energy, uh, which is, uh, of course, generated by eating, eating food and seeds for them. But it's a, I thought that was an interesting analogy because uh, oftentimes you will hear claims that, uh, uh, for example, Bitcoin Network expends energy for nothing. It's not for nothing. It's actually for security. And uh, the keys here, uh, like I mentioned earlier, if you don't hold your private keys, you don't own your cryptocurrency. Somebody else owns it and they can just decide not to give it to you. So very important to remember. If you go to a Lambo store with a, with a bag of cash, you don't let the, and you give the cash to the, to the Lambo dealer, and then you let them keep the keys as well, and the Lambo. That is not an extremely uh, profitable deal for you. You, you are holding all the risk. So. Uh, be sure to take care of your own keys. All right. Um, I think we're going to move to the panel right now, so we don't uh, take more time. Yeah, Ansi, you're interested at least. Do we have some other people joining the panel? Mikko, uh, are you coming? Anybody is free to join. Doesn't matter your level of, of knowledge. We're all here to learn. We have a, a great chance to come and chat with some of the pioneers in Finnish cryptocurrency scene. Great. Let's give a hand for our, our first. Uh... Will you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Jonathan. Maybe I can uh, join you here as well. And I come from the computer science department. I'm a freshman there. Hello. Hello. Is this working? I, I think this is not working, maybe. You can use this one as well. Yeah, so Mikko Lasarla, founder of Inbot. And uh, we have an ICO coming for our token called InToken. I'm a 
serial entrepreneur uh, building my seventh startup in Berlin, Germany, uh, visiting Finland uh, this week. So. Mikko is also the fi Finnish Fred Durst from Limp Biscuit. He has a he usually has a red uh, baseball cap, and he looks just like Fred Durst with glasses. So yeah, uh, hi, I'm Ansi. Uh, I'm also a serial entrepreneur, a full stack developer, uh, UX designer, and also a cryptocurrency enthusiast. So we and I run now. I run Dbounce, which is a decentralized AI audio ecosystem which basically lets um, audio engineers monetize their current knowledge in the future of, of AI, automated AI audio producers. Uh, and, and yeah, so, so we actually operate a hybrid uh, solution. So we have a basically a, a kind of like a centralized service at the moment uh, running on, on, on really high scalable uh, infrastructure on Amazon and now that you know uh, what you've most probably seen with you know crypto kitties uh, the ethereum network isn't capable of, of 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 handling you know large loads and 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 that's also a very interesting topic we're gonna cover uh, here uh, in the panel as well thank you for the introductions yeah that's uh, who knows crypto kitties Oh, quite a few. Do you have, who has a CryptoKitty? I have one. I'm, I'm the only one who, uh, who can admit. All right, that's fair. Uh, Marcus, would you like to join us for the yeah. panel? Yeah, sure. Let's see if I get here. Of course, help yourself. So, um, yeah, um, I wanted to talk about when blockchain. Uh, sometimes people are asking why blockchain? Uh, I think that question is not so relevant than when, because uh, blockchain, believe it or not, with all the buzzwords and, and hype, it is not a solution for every problem we have in technology. It is not a solution to uh, scale up businesses, no matter what. Uh, go ahead. I think I'll just stand. And yeah, the question is when to use a blockchain. And my, my um, opinion on the matter is that uh, if you don't need censorship resistance, if you don't need immutability, if you don't need a decentralized uh, database, you do not need a blockchain. And uh, I would like to hear the thoughts of the panel. So happy to start. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's obvious that uh, blockchain is not a very efficient mechanism of running a database, as Ansi said. Um, I think the best use case for blockchain right now is money uh, because because uh, it does have the requirement of it not being controlled by a single party that would create a uh, like single point of failure or somebody like could steal everybody's money out of it if, if you're talking about let's say supercells virtual currency in the games they could shut it down anytime or they can take out your balance they could do anything they want of course you don't care because you're just playing the game but you know when it comes into um, money in, in uh, let's say, more broad, usable sense. Uh, blockchain is the best, best use case for, for, for such, a, such an application. There are a couple of other applications where blockchain is useful. Um, one is uh, international registries. Uh, so if you want to do registries that are not controlled by a single government, um, let's say you wanted to do an international car registry, for example, it could be a useful way of uh, sharing the responsibilities of storing that across, across the different things. Uh, other than that, I would defer to what Nico said, censorship resistance, you know. Yeah, I can actually continue on that. Uh, Nico's very good statement about money. So lo like, you know, uh, for example, our use case, uh, we are basically taking the current job away from an audio engineer. But what we are doing, we are actually giving a better one to them in return. And that actually would not be possible without a, 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 a um, kind of like censorship resistant and, and as, as Mikko said, we couldn't take down the kind of like their account balances. So, so uh, they have a secure paycheck in the future, basically. Also. 
Money, money, money in the rich man's world. I don't think so. It's not just money that, that I think that uh, we are in quite early era of the blockchain uh, solutions that, that where all we will use the blockchain. That, that, that of course, it's a sexy and, and it's a important and every company and, and think that it's really a, a hot potato, the thing that, that to talk around the money, but but I see like, uh, okay, money, other property as well, that, that if you really think the ownership and you want to put the ownerships down like that, that uh, I think the ownerships are a lot in the creative people's minds that, that, that they could really uh, benefit to their fruits that they bring into this world and, and I, I think that in the VHO has a defined a purpose to people, humankind that in by year 2030 we hope that every person that comes to this planet and goes away at least they would get the COM stamp, they will get their own identity and there will be a record of their visit in this planet and, and I think that, that we are in very early states and I believe that we will see a lot of blockchain solutions. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, in addition to money, there's other type of valuables, like uh, maybe real estate, maybe stocks, maybe some other things that can be tokenized with security tokens. Uh, the most important uh, benefit from uh, having security tokens over having equity is that they would be uh, going across country borders. So if you have equity in specific countries, you have to be bound by that country's legislation. So U.S. equities with U.S., you know, Finnish equities with Finland and so on. Uh, that creates all kinds of barriers that are not very useful in today's world. So that's why I do believe also in security tokens from that point of view. Yeah, and one of the main points is centralization and decentralization, but uh, I think there's also value in non-public and centralized blockchains like the uh, permissioned blockchains, I think they're called. Like Walmart is thinking about adding it to their logic, logistics um, pipeline and it can also help there and yeah there are also more general tokens like there are often tokens that are meant for a specific uh, use case but there are tokens like uh, iota that are they are meant for uh, transferring value, but they are not tied to any specific use case. Yeah, and also, really quickly, uh, one thing that was really interesting in, in New York uh, was the rise of, of these um, unique uh, ERC721 tokens that are basically proof of ownership. So. So I could actually purchase a crypto kitty, which is a rare and unique item. And if I, if I held that uh, particular crypto, crypto kitty and the private keys to that, I could you know, prove, prove ownership, even though you know, someone else might be uh, auctioning, auctioning a copy of that, I could then step, step down and say that, hey, no, I am actually the uh, rightful owner of this piece. So that's also something that's very interesting and that's gonna, gonna happen in the future on a larger scale. Yeah, very good comments. Uh, Henry, uh, quick remarks before we move on to the next topic. Yes, uh, I would consider on the regulation part because that is usually one of the main factors. And in the future, I would see that we are going to see more like contract-based system where people can themselves make contract and I think this blockchain technology is great for that and it goes 
back to like in the uh, 100 years ago when we had a totally different system. It was more agricultural based and before the Industrial Revolution. And then we had a contract-based system, and people made contracts with each other in groups and just person to person. But the Industrial Revolution just couldn't really manage that in the same perspective like, uh, like before. But I think the contract, what the, let's say, uh, the IRS and taxation officials usually use as a term, like in Finland, I do not know what is the contract, really the term, what they use in other countries as well, about cryptocurrencies, that what they are usually. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think the, the label affects so much on the future. What is cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, blockchain technology? That ex I expect that to affect greatly on the regulation side. Thank you for the panel. Uh, great, great insight, and I, I do agree that it's a future thing that every all the ownerships will go to the blockchain, and that uh, seems like obvious to me uh, that uh, recording uh, ownership of anything uh, uh, in an immutable way so that nobody can take it away from you seems like a slam dunk to me. Of course, you have to realize that once you tie real life assets to blockchain, it's still subject to the actual um, authorities and companies to honor your your uh, ownership and claim on, let's say, real estate. Oh, sorry. Um, let's move on to the next one. So yeah, there's uh, there's uh, actually yeah, I forgot about this slide. Uh, there's uh, about tokenization. Um, we we can uh, tokenize some ownerships of like let's say uh, a car or for sharing economy, and uh, then you can find liquidity um, on your ownerships uh, through tokenization. And that promotes, of course, personal responsibility. It also enables transparency and privacy. And it enables economic freedom for a lot of uh, people that are currently unbanked. And I would like to uh, present a thought for the panel, um, uh, another use case for blockchain besides money, uh, since that's probably interesting. Voting, for example. Voting is something that uh, can be done within the company, but also in democracy. And my belief is that we already have the technology to organize a fully transparent vote that can't be um, touched, the result, and, and there wouldn't be a way to um, make it do anything shady and it would be totally transparent. And I think it's a, it's a little bit, well, it's not weird. It's understandable why governments are not so keen on take, taking this kind of uh, approach in voting. And uh, I was wondering if you, if the panel shares shares my view or do you have a want to challenge that? It all comes down to, to proving the identity. And uh, that's actually uh, something that is not very easily solvable with blockchains. So you could say that there's all kinds of identity providers on blockchain today, but uh, it's actually a very, very difficult problem. Uh, so how do you create an identity that is surely identifying a specific person which is secure and privacy friendly and still immutably recorded in the blockchain. There is a project called Sovereign, Sovereign like which is trying to do it via saving a, like a proof of the validation data in blockchain, but without the data itself. But uh, I still think that it's a, it's a problem that, that will take some time to solve in a proper way. Yeah, I actually think so too. There was a really good keynote from Vinay Gupta, one of the co-founders of Ethereum. Uh, and, and he also, also said that you know, it's gonna happen in the future, but, but, but we still have a long way to go, like a lo long way to travel there. But um, yeah, I think that, you know, that, 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 that might be a really good thing uh, once the technology is there. Yeah, um, blockchain can be used to solve some of the problems with electronic voting, like um, there's no pra paper trail and the machines can be hacked and over internet is, it is even more complicated and probably not possible without the blockchain. But yeah, there are 
very clear pro problems with it in the initial identification. Uh, I don't think it's a technology only question, uh, the identity. Like I told from the project that, that where everyone could get an identity that they just have been there. But I, I mean that when we got, uh, I don't know, was it 92 or 96, we talked with Mikko there earlier, the Finnish uh, uh, PKI identity in our, our identity card that you could apply. I, I think it was first in the world. Uh, I think uh, the Estonians made it better when they renewed all their passports. They gave everyone their identity in that way that, that you could uh, do kind of new economic things with this uh, strong national identity. But then came the question as well that, that am I like that you gave the first person the identity but the one didn't like it. I don't remember was it who from our lovely politicians, they got their identity and but they wanted to be a private person as well. So when you have an identity, do you need to be in which identity and whose like uh, interest is that, that how they define your identity or is it so that the uh, individuals would and they may define their identity per use that, that you can have a, your identity for this political uh, presentation thing or you can be a, an having identity what's around your hobby that that you are you are a fisherman or you are whatever that that you uh, have then a different identity like I knew first my father that 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 I didn't know the man because he was uh, a, a, a strong man in some ways and very uh, seldom a gentleman and, 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 and but that he was full of love and couldn't express himself but that is the limitation of the people and the thing that, that needs to grow with the ways that with kind of identities and at least this you mentioned the sovereign project that, that these distributed identities like in the distributed other technologies that how can we interact that, that we don't need the government identity, proof of identity, to many activities what we do and this is kind of the thing too that, that, that we could have in our wallets uh, these identities as a loyal customer to this one or my other things that, that you can choose your identities and, and define yourself the way you want to be defined that as, as you do it in le like legally and correct ways that, that I, I think this is part of the developments in, within the identities and the best thing in the thing with blockchains is that the thing that it, it records things nicely that, that, that you have then really the proof like we were here to this thing that, that the individual's property there uh, as creative people they, they do something new that, that it's really their thing what they do and, and yeah, but I don't want to take all the show. <coughs> okay, what I think about this identity thing, I would like to tell you an example. I used to work in a bank and behind the desk, so there were quite a lot of people every day coming there. Could be hundreds. And I think the identity question was there quite prominent because if you look at the driving license of a person who was a bit older, they got their driving license in the 70s. They look totally different. But how to identify them years before and when they changed their hair color or hairstyle? That was a different thing also. And when it comes to the identity question, I think technology probably can solve it a lot better and quicker. And one of the things is that what I just realize that uh, if someone has, let's say, appeared in court, uh, there the identity which you operate is very important. This goes very legal stuff, but if you go there and you show your driving license, that's totally 
different thing because you can have uh, multiple identities as a business person, as a private person. So I think technology actually can make this work a lot better. That's just my idea. Thank you. Very, very interesting points of view. And uh, if, I, if I can uh, offer a, a small reflection, I, I think that, yeah, uh, identifying people on blockchain is a challenge. Um, however, I would say that it's, it brings up an interesting point of how far do we need to be identified to be able to participate in a vote, for example. Like, you can do that anonymously, and that, that kind of creates you uh, another uh, layer of security as well. You can freely, it's a freedom of speech issue as well. Uh, not to be uh, recognized. And there's also, like, if we're going to talk about the alternative um, consensus algorithms compared to Bitcoin's proof of work, that, for example, there's one called delegated proof of work, which essentially means that you are delegating your voting power to somebody you trust, which, of course, creates a, another layer of trust, but that's, uh, that's up to individual people to decide if it's useful or not. I think I think it's not that easy. Like I mean, I understand what you said that that uh, anonymization is uh, could be like you don't have to show. But as soon as you introduce something like this, you also introduce an attack vector to the whole system where somebody can basically take, like in Russian election, for example, uh, every time there's an election for Putin's party, 101 percent of Chechens uh, every every time vote for Putin. So um, it's kind of interesting that there's more than 100 percent of Chechens like uh, on every election voting for him. Uh, but 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 that's how you do it. Like I mean, you basically deny the right to to vote on that part and hijack their vote, and you know make it work for you. So uh, I think I think blockchain could solve that in a proper way. But then you would have to be on your own face because then you cannot fake it in the same way. Okay, quick comments, and then we move on. Yeah, and uh, it may introduce some additional problems like the. Uh, Chinese have the social credit system coming, and if you if it if the identity is used widely, then those activities can be associated with you with certainty, and it's quite a problem. And then <laughs> there's the problem that you can share. You may be able to share the code or private key, and then somebody else can act as though you were acting in that capacity and I think there would have to be some kind of biometrics in addition to a private key to solve that. Yeah, really interesting points and, and yeah, there's uh, certainly different applications where you might uh, present your identity. For example, it might not be such a big problem uh, if you talk about company equity. If you sell your voting rights to somebody, that might be okay. But the political systems, of course, are, are another thing uh, entirely. Very interesting uh, points there. So let's move on to the energy consumption of uh, consensus algorithms, uh, namely Bitcoin, because that's the most widely known. And I'm sure, uh, has anybody here uh, heard that Bitcoin uses a lot of energy? All right, who thinks that Bitcoin uses a lot of energy? All right, interesting. Um, I, would, I would challenge that, I would say, the curse of Bitcoin is that its energy consumption can actually be calculated. Whereas, for example, fiat um, system cannot, cannot. There's absolutely no way for, to provide real, reliably numbers of how much energy does uh, the current monetary system take. And what makes matters even worse is that Bitcoin energy consumption is compared frequently to countries' energy consumption or something like that. And that will be the definition of uh, comparing apples to oranges, in my, in my opinion. So I was wondering if you guys have something to share on that. Yeah, so um, there's multiple act vectors to this, like uh, how, how would you reach a consensus in a blockchain? I mean, proof of work has been a very efficient way of doing with that, even though it has, does have the energy consumption problem. Um, I think in the future, uh, Sharding will definitely be one of the ways of, of, uh, of making those nodes more democratically available for everybody. Because, uh, because if you go into very, uh, how to say, energy heavy or power heavy solutions, uh, you kind of like centralize the system by definition because, because it favors the big players. And uh, of course, like uh, all these coins that are now introducing ASIC resistance, it's a futile, I mean, I don't think it works because, because uh, 
you can design ASICs that are flexible enough of, of, of uh, going across the resistance. So, so eventually you will always go to ASICs at the end of the day. Uh, so if you look from energy point of view, I think uh, the simple solution is going to sharding. Uh, the current problem with sharding is that if you do proof of stake with sharding, which kind of like is the model that Ethereum and, and Hashgraph are pushing forward, uh, the problem with that is that uh, you actually have a completely new type of um, uh, what is that? Fifty-one percent attack available uh, for these networks, which is based on attacking a shard. You know, so you can because because if you have proof of stake based uh, based uh, distribution of votes within a shard, what you can do is that you go with a very low balance in your account to that shard, and then in your shard you increase the uh, wallet, uh, uh, like um, uh, I said, you know, the amount of tokens in the wallet quickly to some level, which is basically controlling the whole world of the sort, and then you instantly introduce the attack at that moment. Uh, most of these networks haven't even thought how to fix this kind of problem. So, so yeah, there's there's different kind of challenges. Like, uh, I mean, energy is one nice way of solving it, but uh, but there's also problems with that. Yeah. I think uh, Dash had some kind like uh, they have the master nodes and they need like thousand Dash currency to like you can't uh, a lot less or more so that it doesn't matter uh, if you put more but then there, there's the problem that uh, you they don't have, the nodes don't have a connection to any human or organization, so they can just put more nodes there, or master nodes, and allocate more currency. But then there's the incentive to not, not control the market, because you will get shut down, but yeah. If you divide the uh, if you divide the blockchain into shards, then uh, the attackable surface becomes like the volume becomes smaller, and you can just put there. Yeah, that's a vector I haven't considered. Nothing to add here. I think the standardization, uh, standardization of things is one thing that, that uh, in two things Finland is Excel in the worldwide and the one is the biometric recognition that, that we have a different kind of approach here than uh, say like in the United States that, that our biometrics works like uh, differently uh, looking from outside person like various things there that the other uh, Finnish, uh, like there are only two, the other one where Finnish, Finnish Excel is the uh, energy sufficient uh, uh, data centers that, that we are in the world class standardization, setting those things. Uh, the thing is that, that like uh, in the power consumption, that, that if you can catch like the energy changing form, uh, to in good purpose, that 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 is one thing. That that it, if it's more controlled than uncontrolled, that that maybe there are some things to consider there. That that that, yeah, just my input. Yes, I would like to add that, like technology level in the environmental sphere, uh, there's lots of lots of research done about many sectors, energy sectors, and this energy consumption thing, I think it could be solved very quickly when more like the environmental corporations uh, are taking part in these blockchain projects. And I think it's a nice challenge for them. I don't know how to fix it. I hope the environmental corporations and projects can do that. 
Thank you. Awesome points again. And uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a hard problem and I don't think anybody at the moment knows how to fix it. We have a system that, that works to some extent. It has its problems. Um, I would uh, defend Bitcoin in that uh, it actually creates a positive incentive model for, for miners, for example. Because miners, they, uh, through game theory, they will only care about making maximum profit because they are in, in the, in the money-making business, literally. So what, how would they maximize their profits is to use the most efficient possible technology to generate electricity to maximize their profit margins. So in my opinion, it, it creates a positive incentive model for the miners to try and uh, develop renewable energy. So that's uh, uh, something, uh, you want to challenge that? Yes. Yeah, so, but that this also leads to the, say, the, the next, next problem, which is that now you can have like one vendor of ASICs that, that controls the whole market on the hardware side. Uh, because now you have the incentive on everybody to have the most energy efficient mining, but then there's only one vendor that can do it the most efficiently, and then they can control the whole whole production of everything, the whole mining infrastructure. Yeah, that, that's that's actually tr true, and and I think that you know the mo <laughs> the best thing would be to kind of like democratize and 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 make it fair for all parties like you know take the power away after a kind of like a certain period of 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 holdings like you know if Mikko holds over 10 BTC and he does mining his you know his his gains uh, wouldn't be that high so it would be democratized but um, that's not gonna happen as long as there's the human basic human uh, instinct of greed or the, the feature we have which is greed uh, it's not going to be solved. Kill people. Yeah, uh, that's kind of like mainly we talk here from the two consensus mechanisms, and there is at least 17, 18 consensus mechanisms that that would be like if it is democratized, like the thing that we all carry something that that produced and maybe heat and, and these can be turned as well so long they get the power that, that they can produce heat or they can produce cold, whatever you need. So uh, you can like do this data, this exchange these uh, variables in the physical way, just the way needed and, and I think like in the consensus mechanisms that, that we can like think like we don't need to worry from the 51 percent attacks that that when if we have different kind of consensus mechanisms and if it really is distributed to the that everyone carries like these power sources with them let's try to wrap up quickly yeah. uh, I, I actually want to mention this uh, i i really liked uh, originally the idea that iota had that that uh, you can actually do a network where everybody performs services for each other. And so it's basically like an exchange of favors. But because of the, all the problems that they've had with the network and the fact that they've had to use the centralized controller to run that network in, in general, uh, it hasn't been proven yet that this kind of model works. But if somebody proves that this model works, I think that would probably be the most distributed network you can have. Yes, very good point. Uh, one last uh, remark from Henry, and then we wrap up. Do you have something? Yes, I think the energy thing would be probably in the future what, like we have seen in the oil industry, that these uh, certain, like uh, more of like uh, conservative factors. We have to always remember that there are lots of interest in different industries that want to continue certain certain ways of doing things and i think uh, in the energy sector if we can combine like the generations behind this i think we can succeed very quickly thank you henry and thank you panel awesome uh, discussion and uh, i propose we go into the break now and after that we continue in the panel forum is that's okay with everybody and go into Maybe we touched the alternatives quickly, we talked about them a little bit, and then after that, uh, decentralized uh, Starfish organizations versus uh, centralized spider organizations. I think you guys have some insight on that. But uh, for now, let's go to the break. Thank you.
Thank you.